Good morning. Good morning. Praise the Lord. So glad to see all of you and all of you wearing our gray, uh, gray and red shirt. Uh, for those of you uh, who are, who've attended the camp for the first time today, attending our service, that shirt represents the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know that dog there. If you look at the, the core of that fire there, it's right at the at the center of the fire. The Bible tells us that the Spirit dwells in our innermost being. Meaning he dwells not just in the innermost part of your body, he dwells in the innermost part of your spirit. And that fire represents your fire for God. And you know that fire can diminish, you know. God will not never depart, never forsake you. He's going to be there. He promised to never leave us to forsake us. But there are times that fire can diminish, can be less. You know, because of sin, because of discouragement, maybe struggles in life. But what's amazing is the Spirit remains. He is constantly with you, whether you are in the midst of a struggle or in the midst of joys and victories. Like, I pray that right now during this camp, that fire is burning brightly. As I enjoy, saw the first design and Carlo, they were complaining, they were saying, Pastor Al, the fire is so big. <laughs> but I realized, I, let's keep the fire big. So, <laughs> so we know that the fire is, very, is bright, burning brightly, right? Uh, you know, and us, and good thing they didn't complain. Right, Joy? Yes, Joy and Carla? Yeah. <laughs> so we printed this right away, this design. Amen. And, and so, what I'm going to do in the time that we have, okay, we, we have good time. Um, I shared last night our trip to Israel, and I'm going to, for those who, has, who are here for the first time, I'm going to do sort of a shorter version than what we did last night, although I only did two days last night. Right now, I'll try, I'll try to put everything from the beginning to end, but only one photo per place. Last night, we had more pictures per place. And the reason why I'm going to show this is I realized that there's a message God gave to me when I was in the airplane. Or for some of you that know, Rel and I, we just arrived from Israel. We arrived last Thursday, and we didn't have good sleep uh, because of jet lag, and we were in the, traveling for 30 hours almost 30 hours, and arrived here, and we had the town, and no sleep as well. Uh, praise God, last night I had four, five hours, at least five hours of sleep. So that's the longest sleep I had in the last week, actually, in the last few days. So, good, and, and God bless us with this opportunity. I believe there's a reason, because, you know, I struggled physically there. I wasn't able to walk because of my gout. I wasn't able to walk very well, so I was with the with a 70-something-year-old people in the church who they were like walking very slowly, so I was with them. Uh, because there's a lot of stairs to go up, like like in Masada, like, ah, oh, stairs. Uh, and, 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 but, but good, I was able to go through that. And what's interesting is, as I told some of you, the gout went away on the day we were flying back to Austin. So there's, there's a message there, right? <laughs> the whole time in pain, about to go home, I felt good. But I was bringing my crutches all the time. That's why people know that I was disabled because the crutches is always with me the whole trip. But I, I wanted to share something that God pressed in my heart while on the plane. But I'm going to start with our trip first before I head to that. But let me, let me also remind you that we have our material. For those who are here for, who are here for the first time, you grab a copy. We're going to have all the copies here. Everything that was discussed here, it's all here. Uh, and so if you want to know what we talk about in this kind of camp, it's all here. And I know some of our, our brothers in the video, video, audio, video ministry, media ministry took videos of this event. So we'll post this somewhere so that we can, uh, everyone can access also. So I want to first start about our trip because it will lead to the message I want to share today. And it's, it's just going to be a summary of the entire camp. So, so nothing, I'm not going to share anything new this morning compared to what we talked about in the last uh, days, several days. And, and uh, but I, I want to relate it to our trip. So I put all the dots there. So those are all the places we went to in the last 10 days, or 10 days in this round. So those are the dots are all the places we went, uh, uh, visited. And, and the northernmost part, we visited, the, we visited that area close to Lebanon. We actually saw the subdivisions of Lebanon while we were there. And, and, uh, sorry. and, and also the southernmost part was, uh, that was Masada actually, there at the, 
at the Dead Sea, the lowest part by the Dead Sea. We actually took a bath, uh, sw uh, swam a little bit at the Dead Sea. Uh, that was really good. Very unique, unique experience. Never experienced anything like that in my life. And you cannot drown in that water. Yeah, um, so the first place we went was Tel Aviv. That's a modern city, but I just want to point out that that was, in that city was the city of Jaffa or jo Jopa. If you remember when Peter had a vision of that, of that uh, sheet with all the unclean animals, this was the place where Peter was. Then not too far from that place is Caesarea by the sea, Mar Maritima by the sea. This was the place where Peter, after he had a vision, God called him to, or the Lord led him to preach to the household of Cornelius. And he lives in, in that city of Caesarea. He was a Roman centurion, right? And this was also where Paul was in prison. So we were able to go to that place. You know, biblical places. And these are real places. Isn't it amazing that as Christians, you know, we, we need to be grateful to God that our Bible, in fact, our guide, I don't think he was a Christian, but he was very knowledgeable of archaeological finds. He, he speaks, our guide was able to speak like seven, I guess, seven languages. Fluent in Spanish, Hebrew, you know, all kinds, many languages. And he knows a lot of things. And our guy, you know how old he was? He was 70 years old. And he was, I think, the healthiest of all, <laughs> of all the people there. And, and, and he knows a lot of things. And you know what he told us? You, are, you Christians, you are blessed because there's a lot, a lot of archaeological evidences for the Bible. Jews, he said, it's very hard pressed to find archaeological evidence for, for the Old Testament. They don't want to call the Old Testament. Old. They call it the First Testament. Because they don't want to Old Testament. <laughs> we're not Old Testament, we're the First Testament. So that's what they say. But for the New Testament, there's so much archaeological evidence, it's undeniable that, that all those places, all those events in the Bible really, really happen. You can actually go to the places that the Bible talks about, you can step on the ground where those places, and they're still here today. And this is Megiddo, that is the place that's believed where the Armageddon is going to happen, the last battle on earth. It's the, called the Plains of Megiddo. The reason why it's called the Plains of Megiddo, because there's a place there called Megiddo, or Megiddo. I don't know how exactly to pronounce it. But we were on top of the mountain called Mount Carmel, and also you know what Mount Carmel is? That, were, that is where Elijah and the, and, the, and the prophets of Baal battled, and eventually Elijah called far from heaven, and far from heaven came and burnt the sacrifice. Amen? Amen. There's an act of, you know where, where it happened. And there's only one Mount Carmel in, in, in Israel, and that's it. Although we don't know exactly where the altar was built, that's something we don't know. Well, you know, it's on that general area, right? On the top of that, of that mountain or hill. I think, yeah, let's just call it mountain. So we call it mountain. Another place we went was Nazareth. No, I'm sorry that Nazareth is not a quaint small town. It's a big city. And it's a dense, dense city. And so you got all these things. That's why I was telling some of you that Israelites, they like to build their houses on, on the top portion of the hills. Be, in this portion here, there's a slight valley there. Usually there's not much structure. They usually want to build on top of hills. And this is the hometown of Jesus. This is where Jesus lived. This is where Mary, Joseph, Jesus, and his brothers, and his sister, you know, Jesus had brothers and sisters. They live in this place. And we were able to spend time. See, I took this picture very early in the morning because I wanted to take a bath. But I had limited time because we were about to have breakfast and leave. Okay, so I decided not to take a swim but or a bath there. There was a slight, small uh, pantalan or port in there. So, so it was very nice. That boat there is a tour boat. And there were lots of teenagers that morning on that boat. It was so noisy. You think this is very quiet? It was extremely noisy. Because there are two boats there and they're playing loud music. And Jewish music, and these are Jews, my, my, my Hebrew, uh, Jewish teenagers. And they were singing, rah, 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 and it's in Hebrew. <laughs> like singing rock music in Hebrew. Okay. <laughs> Very early at 5 in the morning. <laughs> and there was like probably 30 or 40 youth kid, teenagers in one boat. Yeah, there's a lot of them. And they're all shouting loudly to whatever rock music in Hebrew. <laughs> So, so early in the morning, I was hearing them even outside my hotel, which is far away, a little bit far. A little bit far. In, so we went to Caesarea Philippi. There are two places. Oh, there's my model there. The other one is an extra. Yeah. I was telling them that's a cheap model and an expensive model. Um, 
Caesarea, there are two Caesareas. One was built by King Herod, the other one was built by Herod, Herod Philip. Uh, and he was the he was the tetrarch of the of the area there, northern part of Israel. Did you know that this was the place where Jesus said, Upon this rock I'll build my church? Because there's a pagan rock there that worships a goat god, a goat half human, half goat god. And Jesus is saying that this is not the kind of rock that we, we're gonna build, I'm gonna build my church, but this is me, I am the rock. I am the foundation of the church. And did you know that there's a place here that's called, that's called Gates of Hell? He said, it's clearly a statement saying that Satan and his demonic forces and all this pagan, Satan-inspired religion cannot prevail against the church of Christ. Meaning Satan cannot prevail against you, against us, against River Life, against all Christian churches, against the church as a whole. We also went up north. This is really at the topmost part of Israel. Again, border of, uh, uh, at the border of Lebanon and Syria. It's called Dan. You know what Dan is, right? It's one of the tribes, one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And remember, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, when Joshua came into the Promised Land, they allocated certain areas for where the tribes will live. Actually, Dan was on the coast, closer to the coast of the Mediterranean. There's, that was the location where Dan was. But I... I don't remember exactly how it happened, but but somehow Dan also had a, an area allocated for them right at the top of the I forgot the, the entire story, but this but but somehow Dan also had an area at the topmost part. And remember in the Bible, because the northern part of Israel separated from the southern part, the southern part has a temple. What did there, there are two kings now, northern and south. The southern kingdom was who was the king of the southern kingdom? Tri trivia? Rehoboam, that's R, Rehoboam. The, the king of the northern kingdom was Jeroboam. And Jeroboam, of course, he doesn't have a temple there. And this is against the will of God. He built a replica of the altar of Jerusalem there. And this was the place, this is the altar they believe built by Jeroboam on the northern kingdom. It's actually described in the Bible. They went to the, you know, they, they were in Dan when they built this. And imitating the temple altar and that temple thing there is just for tourists you know tell them how oh, this was what it looks like so th there was no really the, the rock at the bottom is, re is original from Jeroboam's time but but the metal there is just for illustration purposes para maintindihan ng mga tourists what was there originally it was an altar and then we went to Galilee again and this is I, I would like to I know Americans like to pronounce it's Capernaum but I would like to, to properly pronounce this as Capernaum because the name of Capernaum, it's actually just a word that says this is the village of Nehum. So where is Nehum here? That's your village. <laughs> the village of Nehum. This is where Nehum lived. So probably in ancient time there was a guy named Nehum and that's where he lived. That is why it's called Capernaum, village of Nehum. And did you know that this place is the village where Jesus set his home base of uh, when he did his ministry in Galilee. Peter and the disciples lived there, uh, the, the, the fishermen disciples lived there, and, and they believe that, that some of the streets here, there's another slide that I showed last night, we know Jesus most likely walked that street because it's what, it was their I-35 back then. It was their main road there, so, so likely Jesus went to I-35, right? If he was in Austin. And in that place also there was a synagogue, so it gives you an idea of what the synagogue looked like Back then, it's a, it's a consistent design. We've seen probably four different synagogues, and they all look the same. You got those steps on the side, which is actually where people sit down. A central area that has columns all around. There's a wall at the back. All the synagogues look like that. And some people often think synagogues are religious place. It is not a religious place. It simply means a community meeting place. It's where people just meet for meetings, all kinds of things, conversation, discussion in the community. But they also use that to read the Bible. And Jesus read the Bible, and you know they don't. Today we don't have. They don't. Unlike today, they didn't have copies of the Bible by home, right? So where do where do they go to listen to the Bible? They would go to the synagogue. Siyempre wala naman silang New Testament kung sa bahay nila or or copies of the Bible. So it was in the synagogue. And now you are able to see what a Canaanite city looks like. There's a replica on what it should look like when it was still buo palang siya, a long time ago. And this Canaanite city, 
They say this dates back to the time of Abraham. You know all these Canaanites when Joshua came into the promised land? I didn't have an idea that they lived in cities. I thought they were just like those bad guys in games. They just appear out of nowhere and you fight against them. Uh, some, I know some games they have cities, but that's where they lived. This was a Canaanite city in Dan, as well, the northern part of Israel. And, and they believe, and you can read this in, your, in scripture, they believe that this was the place where Abraham went when he tried to rescue Lot from the Canaanite kings. Remember that? He, with his 300 plus men trying to run after Lot and rescue him, this is where he went because in the Bible it describes that he went as far as Dan. And you know where Dan is? It is the northernmost part of the, of the country of Israel. I mean, it's towards the border of Israel already, really up there. So probably Abraham went to the city and fought with the Canaanite kings. Again, a view of Jordan last night, I'll show this to you. This is near to the Sea of Galilee. So, so notice the water is cool, nice looking, right? Very uh, inviting for swimming. Then we went down 60 miles. Oh, I'm sorry, there's a video there. It's a video. We went down 60 miles, and this is one. Look at the two dots there. It tells you where the first picture I took. And the second picture is down there, 60 miles downstream. Look at the water. It's very muddy. I don't know if this was like this during Jesus' time, probably. Because he no naman ng Jordan naman dumi. Naman didn't want to go back to Jordan, right? But they believe this is where Jesus was baptized. This location. Where John the Baptist because was baptizing. Because this is very close to Jerusalem. Very close to Jerusalem. Compared to the other side. We also went to a synagogue in Migdal. Also known in, in ancient times as Mag Magdala. And there was also a synagogue in there. Look at the design, it's the same. You got the steps, you got the columns, and you got the wall at the back. Just imagine, okay? Just imagine. But it's there. <laughs> and I, as Rella mentioned last time, Mary Magdalene, her last name is not, uh, Magdalene is not her last name, okay? It, it simply means Mary is from the city of Magdala. Just like Jesus is from the city of Nazareth. So Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth is not his last name. Because they didn't have last name back then. They would just put the second name as where the city came from. Like Paul of Tarsus. Right? Jesus of Nazareth. Mary of Magdala. Or Mary the Magdalene. Meaning somebody from Magdala. Um, and Jesus most likely went through the city. We, we, it, it's more, we are more confident. Now this is an interesting, this probably impressed me most of all the cities we visited because what's amazing is there's so much, there, there was still so much stuff in there that you can, you can imagine what it looked like. It's called the, Be, Be, the city of Beit Shan, or, or in the Bible it's called Beth Shan. Shan, where's Shan? Shan is not here today, but it's called Beth, Beth B-P-H, Shan in the Bible. If you read in scripture, it's called Beth Chan, it's here. That's how it's spelled in the Bible. But today it's called Big Chan. And what's interesting about this, this is the city, one of the cities of the Philistines. You know those Philistines that Israel fought against? This is one of where they live. It's a Philistine city. And the main name of the city is mentioned in the Bible. And this was the city where Saul was hung. His body was hung on the walls. It's described in the Bible where he was that he did, when he died, his body was, was hung to, you know, as, a, as an act of you know, shaming him. And then finally, we went to Jerusalem. We took this picture from the Mount of Olives. So the Mount of Olives is towards the eastern gate, right, John? It's on the eastern gate, of a wall, eastern wall of Jerusalem. Uh, and, and so this was from that side. And on this, and that side of Israel is where the Mount of Olives is. And if you go down at the bottom of that Mount of Olives, that's where you find the Garden of Gethsemane. And the Garden of Gethsemane, what you'll find is lots and lots and lots of olive trees. So I know you imagine Garden of Gethsemane like your garden. It wasn't a garden like you think of it. It was a place where they crush olives to sell or to, to, to you know, produce. It's a plantation for olive trees. That's why the word Gethsemane simply means an olive press, and that is what we call a Gethsemane. You look at that, that wooden thing there, that's a Gethsemane. It's an olive press. It's where you crush the olives, press the olives to extract olive oil. And also, we also went to Qumran. 
Now, this is amazing because Qumran, these are the caves of Qumran. There's a, there was an ibex goat in there. Ibex, I would say the goat or sheep, but we saw an ibex inside the cave. Uh, the iPhone is not able to see it clearly. If you have an SLR, you will be able to see it. And this is uh, the community where the Qumran people live. Uh, they were called the Essenes. And what's interesting about Qumran, this is where they discovered copies of the Old Testament that dated from 300 BC to 100 BC. Uh, 300 BC to 100 BC, meaning 100 years before Jesus, copies of the Bible, except the, the book of Esther and Nehemiah. Meaning pretty much every book of the Bible is found, was found there except Esther and Nehemiah. And, and they found in those caves, it tells you that the Bible is not somebody who just written during the time of Jesus. It, was pre it predates Jesus. It, this is one of the greatest, I would say, evidence for the Bible in, in our time. Because did you know that the latest, uh, the oldest Jewish uh, Hebrew Bible we have before Qumran, before this finding, was 10th, 10th century AD. It, it's called the Masoretic Text, MS, you know, in your Bible, usually abbreviated to MS, it's the Masoretic Text. And the Masoretic is dated 1,000 years after Jesus. You know, pinaka early na copy, na oldest copy not in the Bible. With the discovery of this, we find that we now have a copy that predates Jesus in Hebrew. Of course, there's the Greek by Hebrew and, 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 and Latin Vulgate. They're also very old. But Hebrew, we didn't have an old Hebrew Bible. A version, a copy. Now, this changes a lot. You now have a copy, a Hebrew Bible before Jesus. Then, we went... To one of the cities we mentioned in our history class. For those of you attending history class, this is the church of the Nativity in Bethlehem. We went to the uh, Palestinian side, uh, the West Bank. Bethlehem is there. And this houses the location of where Jesus was born. When you think of the manger of Jesus, that's the manger. <laughs> At least under it, that's where the manger was. Long time ago, we don't know where it, it They have a spot where... Jesus was actually born, and so they put the shrine in there. But that's what the church looks like. This was built by Constantine in the 4th century. And we also went to the Dome of the Rock. This was a place, the holiest site. Oh, by the way, this is the holiest, one of the holiest sites for Christians. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about Christian, Christian, Christian the way the world thinks. But not for real Christians, of course. This is not our holy site. <laughs> but but Christ, the Christian world, you know, all the Christians, you know, Orthodox, Catholic, you know, all the Protestants. This is one of the holy sites for uh, Christian Christian world. But uh, definitely not for us. Uh, for the Dome of the Rock, this is one of the holiest sites for the Muslims. And if we were able to go up there after much checking, they have to remove all kinds of objects. We're only allowed to take our phone and our IDs. And the reason is they will not allow us to take, uh, well, we can take pictures, but we were not allowed to pray up there or even read our Bible up there. There was a lot of bawa bawa. So this is controlled by the Muslims, and that dome there, only Muslims are allowed to get in there. But we were able to go around it, take videos, and this is one of the holy sites of the Muslims. And this is a disputed area. If, if, if Christians or Jews is going to try to take this place, it's the end of the world. Right? You know that, right? The Jews want this area because they want to build their temple here. And if they take this over, it's game over for us. Because all the countries that will side with the Muslims will fight with the Jews, and all the Christians will side with the Jews, right? It's that both sides of the world will be at war. That's why this is the most disputed piece of property in the world. Something, something happens here, it's the end of the world. Yeah. And finally, we were able to go to the Wailing Wall. If you notice on those cracks, I have a, show, a, a very close up on those cracks. They actually had their prayer letters in there. They would pray and put you know, their prayers on, on a piece of paper and insert on those cracks. I actually prayed there as well. For me, it's not praying because the wall is holy, but I, want, I was praying for the nation of Israel that they will come to know Christ. God really burdened my heart that moment, looking at all the Jews there, especially among Orthodox Jews. There were two that just approached me, put his hand on me, and they not, and they not, I didn't ask for it, they just, they just put my hand on me and said, Oh, the Lord bless you, uh, keep you, make his face shine upon you. Remember that blessing? Prayed for me. Then afterwards, he said, uh, he told me, 
two hundred dollars. I told him, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have two hundred dollars. He was carrying a plastic bag. But I didn't expect him to do that because he was like, you know, tall hat, really black, long this, long beard, like that, you know. Then he offered two hundred. I said, no, I don't have two hundred. I gave him five dollars. He was okay with it. Then afterwards. Another guy came also and prayed for me, okay, pray for me. Then okay, I opened the bag, asking for money. Told him I gave the other guy my money. Right? <laughs> said, okay, thank you. Yeah. Then so I was there, Rella was there. This is only the men's side, on this on the right, left side and the right side are the women. It was divided by that, you know, those mapayong there we have beyond that are the women. So men and women they have their area there. And then this is interesting, we went in under the Hezekiah Tunnel. If you get, just to give you an idea, the Hezekiah Tunnel is that mine that goes under the city. It's around 1,600 feet long. And not a lot of people in our group were brave enough to go through it because it was very narrow. It was just enough for me. So if you're, you have more mass in your body, you have to move like this. <laughs> because it's so tight and there's water on different areas. The water is up to here and the water is down here. And there were around a few of us, less than 10 of us who went to the tunnel. That's a picture of me at the back and the pa other pastors that were with me. I was the last guy on the, on the line inside the tunnel. And it was very dark. There's no light, zero light. Because I look back, I cannot see anything. I was trying to take video. Even the iPhone could not produce any picture because it, so, it wasn't dark. So we really had our iPhone lights going through it. And, and this is the entrance to where the tunnel where Rela is modeling. It's just, it goes down, 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 down. And the purpose of this tunnel, there's a spring in you know, Israel called Gihon Spring. It's outside the city walls. And its purpose is to bring those water inside the city into what is called the Pool of Siloam. So the water in Siloam comes from the Gihon Spring and it, it goes through that tunnel, carried, carried to the tunnel. And the one that built this is mentioned in the Bible in 2 Kings. It was King Hezekiah. Imagine I was able to go through a tunnel that was built by King Hezekiah. It's there and it's mentioned in the Bible. And there's even a sign in there that says, this is the tunnel built by King Hezekiah. They actually removed the sign. They just have a replica. I said, I think the sign is somewhere else. It's in a museum. They just put in a replica. I said, you know, you don't want Luther's to get the sign. And it's to protect from, Hezekiah built it to protect from a siege, preparation for a siege. And also, we finally went to, and that's the pool of Siloam. So I'm sorry, it doesn't look good. Rela looks good, but not the pool. <laughs> Rela looks good, no question about that. But that is the pool of Siloam today. I think it was bigger back then at Abuna na siya, but I, that is what the Siloam... I know Mama was telling me you should go to the pool of Siloam. Oh. You know, to... <laughs> there might be an angel there. But, but that, there's the water and that's what it looks like today, pool of Siloam. It's at the end of the tunnel, by the way. And at the beginning of that pool of Siloam in Konting Tubig, there's a lot of kids playing there, but, but towards that area, Malanang Tubig. And lastly, my last slide, Garden Tube. There are six places they believe that Jesus was buried and where he rose from the dead, but archaeologically, others are based on tradition, but they mainly believe archaeologically, this is the most, I would say, archaeologically matches with the Bible because it's in the garden. Remember, when, when Mary Magdalene came, came, went to this place, what did he assume, the guy there? He was a gardener. Therefore, where Jesus was entombed, it was a garden. Because there was a gardener there. And there's a place close to this, and, and we know from the Bible that where Jesus was crucified is not far from the tomb, called Place of Skull. And there's a mountain, I don't have the picture here, but I have another slide, it looks like the face of a skull. Two eyes, nose, and in ancient times that even more looks like a skull. Because there's a mountain that looks like a skull. And that's why the place where Jesus was crucified is called the place of the skull, right? We know that from the Bible as well. So why what's the point of me sharing this in the morning? Not just to encourage you about the trip, not just to encourage you maybe one day you can go there. But what God told me or encouraged me during the plane, it I, I just sense in my heart this was God telling me before arriving in Israel. We call the Israel Holy Land. We call these places holy places. 
You know, you're not, women there are not allowed to wear short sleeve on some places. You have to wear a sleeve longer than your, your elbow. And you have to wear dresses that goes to your feet, not showing parts of your legs. Because they are supposed to be holy places. God reminded me that really none of these places are holy. Because what makes a place holy is the presence of God. And 2,000 years ago, when Jesus died on the cross, the curtain of the temple was torn in two, and the glory of God, God's presence, departed from the temple. God is not there anymore. And there's a temple, but God was not there already after that happened. So the, there's, it's not anymore holy. Now the question is, where is what is holy now in this world? What is holy in this world? Let me read to you a passage found in 1 Corinthians 1. What is holy in this world? Corinthians. You know the Corinthians, right? Have you read the, the letter of Corinthians? I encourage you to read, read this. The Corinthians, they were not good Christians. They were not good Christians. They were suing one another, fighting one another. And, you know... Factions, I am for Jesus, I am for Paul, I am for Peter. And this is like united. Right? It was a very problematic church. And if you read Corinthians, it was, it was angry at them, reprimanding them. In fact, what's even worse, some people there are committing immorality in, uh, you cannot even imagine today. I know there's a lot of immorality today. Mas grabe pa yung immorality doon. But you know what Paul said, told the Corinthians in the very first, first few verses? I'm going to read this to you. 1 Corinthians 1, starting verse 1. Paul called, the will, called by the will of God to be an apostle for Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God that is in Corinth. Okay? Those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus called to be saints. Wow. Really? Not good. They're not the kind of Christians you would want to imitate. But you know what Paul them, called them? You are saints. Santo kayo. You are saints. Did you know the word saint is the word that says set apart or holy? He was calling the Corinthians, you are holy people. Paano they're fighting one another, suing one another, immoral in their conduct. Yet God called them, you, Paul called them, holy. Meaning, we are the ones who are holy in this world. Why is it? Why are we called holy? Is it, is it because we're good people? I don't think so. I, I, I know some of you. Not all of you, but I know some of you, and many of us are not holy. You know me, Rella knows me, and she knows that I'm not holy at home. I look holy here in front, maybe. But most of the time at home, no. But you know what makes us holy? It's because God's presence is in us. The holy of holies now is not the temple, it's not the Ark of the Covenant, it's not the holy of holies, and it is the innermost part of who you, in your being. Your heart, your spirit. That is the Holy of Holies. And the Spirit dwells in you. Not those holy places there. You. You are holy. Amen? Amen. Because God is, the Holy God is in you through the Holy Spirit. And we need to recognize this. We need to come near to Him because the Bible says that He groans and prays on your behalf especially in your weakness, meaning, meaning one of the missions of the Holy Spirit is used to help you in your struggles, to help you in your difficulties, problems, in your weakness. That's one of His mission. That is why we are to come to Him when we're going through difficult times. But why is it for some of us He is the last resort? He has to be our first resort. The Holy Spirit also leads us and guides us. The Bible says God sent the Spirit into our hearts. And you are led by the Spirit of God because you are the sons and daughters of God. And that's why we also need to acknowledge Him. We also need to ask for His guidance in every decision we're going to make. The Bible also tells us that we are not to grieve the Spirit. 
We are not to quench the Spirit, and we quench and we grieve Him when we disobey Him. That's why we are to make a commitment to obey Him and not grieve Him. Because He's a person. He can be sorrowful when you disobey Him. And what grieves Him? What brings sorrow to the Holy Spirit that's in you? Sin. And there's a lot of things that can cause you sin in this world. We will talk about this. The flesh and all it related to it. The world, materialism, any ideas that is against God. And you got also the devil himself. Who cause you to sin, can discourage you. And you know the purpose of Satan. You cannot be unsaved, by the way. Satan cannot take you back to his kingdom. But he can make you ineffective in this world. He can make you fruitless, discouraged, useless for God in this world. That's what Satan can do. God, he will do everything to make you useless. That's why we need to fight against sin. Because that is his foothold. That is the way he's going to take advantage of you. That's why we need to deal with it. Because we, do, we want to be fruitful, right? We want to be used by God. We want to be filled with joy and purpose like what we heard in the camp today. Oh, I pray that your heart is overjoyed. We want to have that all the time, constantly. I know there are times where we're down, but we want to have, we want to go back to that quickly. And we learn also that the only way for you to keep Christ, keep the Holy Spirit at, at the heart of your daily life, we talk about the disciple course. Spend time in the Word of God. Spend time in prayer. Spend time in fellowship. Spend time in witnessing to others. The four disciplines of the Christian life. Make it consistent in your life. Prayer, Word of God, fellowship with believers. You notice that whenever we have some event like this, we are on fire. That's the reason why fellowship is, is important. Because it keeps us alive, keeps us strong. And share your gospel. Remember in your, the last time you shared the gospel with someone and the person responded to what you shared? How does it impact you? Grab it, right? I'm going to share about Tate, for instance. Tate is here. You know, there was a time when I shared to him the word of God. He understood. Tate probably doesn't remember this anymore. But he was so excited about what he understood. You know what in my heart when they say? He was so excited about understanding the word of God. Right in the car, after we talked, I, told, I was praying, Lord, you can take my life now. <laughs> I was that so excited after that moment. I was going to die that very moment in my, in my excitement about when they, you know, understood what I was sharing with him. So overjoyed. And that is what keeps our fire strong. Amen. Right? Whenever you come to the Word, bang, the fire just, just bursts into flames. Uh, very, very, the flame just becomes stronger. When you fellowship, fire increases. And that's why when Paul told Timothy, fan the flame of the Spirit, this is what it is. We are fanning the flame of the Spirit, like in this moment of fellowship. Amen? Amen? Okay, in closing, let's all rise up, and I would like us to make that commitment. Let's make that commitment to God. You know, God wants us to be bold. Let's see, let's see our, let me make sure. Okay. Let's make a commitment before God. Lord, let's, 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 let's talk to Him. All of us, Lord God of heaven, in the name of Jesus, we acknowledge your Holy Spirit, that He is in us, in my innermost being. Lord God of heaven, I will obey Him, I will follow His lead, I will not grieve Him, I will not quench Him. I will not let sin dominate my life. I will call him when I am in trouble. I will cry out for him. I will cry out to him for wisdom, understanding, knowledge when I need his guidance. Help me, Lord, by your grace, by your power, by your mercy. In Jesus' name, Jesus. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let me pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the encouragement throughout this camp. Lord, thank you for the messages, for the, the word 
that has spoken in our hearts. I know, Lord, that you spoke to everyone, Lord, in different ways of God. For we are in different situations, paths, uh, Lord, in our personal walk with you. But, Lord, each of us has received, Lord, I believe, a personal word from you, personal encouragement from you. Lord, may the flame continually burn brighter, Lord, even as we depart from this place today. Lord, I entrust unto you our kids. But many of them, Lord, don't fully grasp what is going on here, Lord. But, Lord, may they fully understand in due time, Lord. For those kids who understand, Lord, may their faith, O oh God, be established. Even the little ones that they still trying to figure out these things, may their faith be established early on, Lord. That they will hold on to this for the rest of their life, Lord. And we as well, Lord God, we will never, uh, Lord God, allow the world, uh, the flesh, and Satan, Lord God, to hinder us. For he is a defeated foe. And Lord, Amen. that in everything that we do, Lord God, you are with us. You are in us. You are in our yes. innermost being, Lord. And there's not a single moment that you are not with us. Amen. And remind us of this truth, Lord. Yes. Remind us of this truth every moment, Lord. Whether in times of struggle or in times of victory, in times of sorrow or in times of joy, O oh God. And you are always with us. You promise to never leave us, to forsake us. Thank you, Lord. And bless also our baptism we're going to do today. And bless the rest of our day. All glory be to you, O God of heaven, and your Son, Jesus, and your Holy Spirit, who is in us, leading and guiding us, who loves us and cares for us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.